this series. And each week we've been highlighting a different partner that we have, mission partners that help us advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, that help us take the word all around the world. And I'm super excited today to uh, introduce to you a ministry that may not be new to many of you, may be new to some of you. In fact, Miss Cheryl and I had an opportunity to go and tour this facility this past week. And many of the people you're going to see in the video in just a moment, we had the privilege and the joy of being able to meet. And so we're super excited about this. We believe that we alone cannot do what it takes to literally spread the gospel around the world. But we as a church family linked up with other mission partners and other local churches can take the gospel around the world. There are not many churches. There are only one church. Amen? That is the born again, blood bought church of the redeemed. There's only one. And we're a local expression of that at Grace Way. Well, take just a moment. Let me introduce you to a wonderful ministry partnership that we have that helps us take the gospel around around the world. Watch this. Hi, I'm Caroline, and I have a lighthouse story. My name is Deirdre, and I have a lighthouse story. My name is John, and I have a lighthouse story. My name is Walter. I was running the roads from New Jersey to Florida. My life was a wreck. I was using alcohol, crack cocaine, and methamphetamines. I wanted to change, but I couldn't on my own. One day, an Uber driver drove me up in front of the Lighthouse Men's Ministry Center and told me this is where I needed to be. Praise the Lord. Today, I'm clean, sober, and ready to serve God in the ministry. Lighthouse provided a new lease on life for men like me through Jesus the Christ. That is my Lighthouse story. Thank you. My name is Jessica, and I have a Lighthouse story. My name is Jim, and I have a Lighthouse story. My name is Leander, and I have a Lighthouse story. My name is Chris, and I have a Lighthouse story. My name is Tashika, and I have a Lighthouse story. My name is Lynn, and I do have a Lighthouse story. Hello, my name is Nick. I was eight years old when the doctor told my brother and I that our mother was going to die of cancer. She was a fighter who was somehow surviving cancer. Then our house caught on fire and she died. Was I mad at God? You better believe it. I used alcohol and any other substance to numb the pain. Then one day while fueled on alcohol and amphetamines, I was hit by a car and broke 11 bones in my face and literally cracked my skull. This left me with serious brain damage. I couldn't even remember my own phone number much of the time. I sunk deeper and deeper into depression and substance abuse. But God was reaching out for me and his grace got me into the life recovery program at Lighthouse Ministries. They provided a special Nova memory program for me and I began to regain the use of my memory. While in Lighthouse, I found the power attached to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today I'm healthy, married, recovered, and have two amazing children. I'm giving back as the Lighthouse Ministries logistics manager. I went on to graduate from college, an accomplishment I never thought would happen. God is good, and I know that your kindness and generosity made this happen. This is my Lighthouse story. Thank you. Hello. On behalf of the Lighthouse board and the entire team, here's an invitation. If you know someone homeless or addicted, we can help them find recovery. Our comprehensive 7 to 24 month program provides the tools needed for a complete transformation. Our services are free of charge as we are supported entirely by the generosity of Christians who believe in the power of the gospel. A day will come when you need to connect someone with Lighthouse Ministries. Look us up online today at lighthousemin.org. I'm your executive director, Steve Turbyville, thanking you for joining us and sharing the good news and the good works of the gospel. Amen. We are so thrilled to be partnering with Lighthouse Ministries. In fact, while we were there just the other day, Walter, one of the first men that you heard speak, uh, we were there uh, sitting in the chapel. We were sharing and had been touring the facility. Walter walked through and introduced himself and wanted to know what we did. And I said, well, I pastor Graceway Church over in Plant City. And he said, oh, he said, then you definitely need to hear my story. And for about 15 minutes, we heard Walter's amazing story and testimony of how God took him from the broken shambles of life and now has set his feet on a rock. And now he's helping other people being pulled up on that rock. And he was so excited. He was just uh, exuberant and uh, left our presence and you can hear him all around 
around the facility for the next 30 minutes, all going throughout the kitchen. He was just, hallelujah, praise God, I've been saved, I've been set free. I mean, he was just all over it, super excited. And I thought, you know what? Every single person who battles and struggles with addiction needs to have hope that they too can be pulled out of the pits and they can be lifted up on a rock. And so I'm thankful that we can partner with Lighthouse because being a grace ministry, we have tons of people that come to us and they have so many uh, addictions and so many things going on in their life that sometimes we can't help them. And it's great to know that we have a partner that we can plug in with and we can help them get them in a program and we can help them be recovered, made whole, and start giving back again. Isn't that cool? Super excited about that. Today at the end of our service, we'll be receiving the Heart for the Harvest offering. We're going to do things a little different today, so just hang with me and we'll share with you what that difference will look like. Growing up, I never was one for playing cards. A little too boring for me. And sit around a table and, you know, you have your cards and you're dealing cards. And I'm like, I, I don't know the difference in all those cards. It doesn't make sense to me. And, and it just, I don't know. I, I just couldn't do it. I'm not a card player. And I've certainly never been a gambler. I've never had anything to gamble with. <laughs> and so gambling which wasn't my thing either. But I tell you what I did do. I have had the joy and the privilege of being able to watch some people play cards and watch some poker games uh, that took place. And I'll never forget the one thing that was intriguing to me is when you would see somebody take all of these chips, push them all to the center, and they said these words, I'm going all in. I'll never forget the first time I heard those words and I thought, man, what does that mean they're going all in? I mean, they're pushing all their chips and those chips have value. They're pushing all those chips to the center and they're going all in. But what does that really look like? What does that really mean? It means this. They believe in the hand that they've been dealt the cards that are in their hand, they believe so strongly and so passionately that their hand is going to take the whole table, that they are willing to put everything they have on the line. They're ready to go all in. Thought, man, you must be really confident about that because I tell you what, the times I play cards, they dealt me cards, I'm going, listen. This nine and this four and this two and this six, it ain't going nowhere, right? I mean, it ain't getting me nothing. I didn't understand all that. And when they, you know, they, they have all these different names for all these different sets and all this, it just, it just doesn't do anything for me. But the all in got me. How could somebody be so passionate and believe so much in something that they would go all in and put everything on the line. And then I realize that that is exactly what God is asking of you and I. God is asking of you and I that we would take all that we are, all that we ever hope to be, and all that we have, and wanting us to push it to the center of the table and be able to say, God, I'm going all in. I'm putting everything I am and all that I have on the line. I believe so strongly in the power of the resurrected Christ that I'm going to put my life on the line for Jesus. The question is, do you believe that strongly? That God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do to put everything on the line. You say, well, what's the alternative, Pastor D? Well, the alternative is you can hang on to your life and lose it. The scripture says, what I hang on to and keep to myself, I lose. But what I give to God is blessed and multiplied. I want every part of my life blessed and multiplied. I want the favor of God to rest upon me in such great fashion that every time I step out in faith to do something, that God steps in and supernaturally breathes on it 
and moves it forward for his glory. That's what I want. I want the anointing that strong. Maybe you've had times in your life where you've had situations where you've had to decide if you really believe enough to go all in and then trust God with the outcome. Maybe it was a marriage. Maybe a marriage that was struggling. And maybe you had to come to the place of deciding, am I going to go all in and see what happens? Because let's be honest. Sometimes when we go all in, we lose. See, sometimes life in itself is a gamble. Sometimes we can go all in and there's another individual there that has to go all in as well. 50-50. Maybe it's a, a marriage that we have to decide, are we going all in? And then you have to ask the question, even if the other person doesn't go all in, did I really lose? Because you see, God honors those who honor him. And when you've done all that you can do, God steps in and does what you and I cannot do. Maybe it was financial investments. I have a good friend of mine who is a financial investor and he kills me because he can take a look at numbers, he can punch a few keys, and within minutes he can multiply his stocks and his investments just like that. I, I will never forget the day we were sitting down at a table together and he basically said, I'm taking all of my investments, I'm taking all of my stocks, I'm pulling them together and I'm in one single place. And I remember saying to him, that's dangerous. I was always told, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Spread them around. He said, no. He said, I'm taking everything and I'm putting it all in one place. And I said, so what could the outcome be? And he said, well, we're going to know in about 36 minutes. He said, in 36 minutes... Either everything that I'm investing in is going to sink and I will lose every dime I own. Or I stand the chance of quadrupling my investment. We talked and chatted. We got down to about 35 minutes and a half and he looks at me and he goes, shh. And he's watching the screen, the ticker, really, really carefully. And then all of a sudden, I didn't know what was happening. I don't know what that stuff looks like. It's just a bunch of numbers and a bunch of lines going up and down. But all of a sudden, he looks at me and he says, yes, thank you, Jesus. Quadruple my money right there in 36 minutes. You see, he knew that sometimes you got to take a chance. He knew that he had to go all in and take a chance he could have lost but instead he gained see what most of the time happens is us we focus on what could go wrong rather than focusing on what could go right what if God wants to step into the middle of our situation and he wants to elevate us to a place that we could never reach on our own you see, that is the power of God. That is what God does. God does the supernatural. Maybe it's with our hobbies, other areas in our life. Maybe it's with our spiritual life to go all in. You say, well, we knew some people that went all in. Job went all in. Did, remember Job going all in? And he lost everything. <clears throat> and everybody said, well, Job... You, you, you must have sin in your life. And that's the reason you've lost everything. But in fact, he was one of the godliest men that ever lived. And God was allowing him to be tested. And because he had honored God, through it all, he stayed faithful. Through it all, he stepped out. Through it all, he stepped in. He went all in for God. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to restore you. And he was blessed and restored to greater than what he had and what he lost. Can I tell you that when you and I go all in with God, 
we will never go wrong. But we will always be in the right place for God to bless and honor us. So let me tell you about a woman for the next few moments who went all in from an Old Testament book, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Let me read it to you, for there's a story here. And then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. And so he went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water and a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, And bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left that the characters and the stories that are embedded in the Old Testament, we forget that these characters are real people just like you and I. So I want you to pretend with me just for a moment today that you're right there in that story. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of this widow woman. She was a woman who had hopes and dreams. She was a woman who believed. She was a woman who doubted. She was a woman who felt great joy, but a woman who also experienced great despair. She was a woman who had suffered real pain. But she was also a woman like, like us, don't always know what's going to happen next. See, sometimes we read the Word of God, and as we read it, we automatically think because we have the full story that they did too. But that's not the case. In fact, they didn't have the full story. In, in fact, what they didn't have was anything more than what they knew that was going on at the moment. You and I look and we see the outcome of this dear woman. She did not know the outcome. She did not know what was going to happen next. All she knew was what was happening at that very moment. Imagine what it was like for her. Just her and her little boy. Her husband had died. And together, mother and son were literally starving to death. In fact, they were victims of a widespread famine. And there was no place to go. There was nothing to do about their plight. And she had faced the reality of their demise. She would take her little pot of flour. She would take her little bit of oil that she had left. She would gather up some sticks. She would make a little cake. They would eat this final funeral meal. And they would lay down to die. What would you be thinking right now if that were you? How would you be feeling and processing things on the inside? What would you be thinking about God? Probably the same thing that we think about God when we get into situations like that. God, why did you let this happen to me? God, why did you bring this into my life? God, why did I lose my husband? Why did I lose my dad? God, why? It's probably the same things that she was asking. God, why would you let me and my boy come to the place of suffering that we have just enough food left for one single meal and then after we eat this meal we are destined to die I mean what would you say if that were your son what would you tell your son God's not who he says he is God's not as powerful as he says he is God can't do everything he said he could do. What would you do? How would you respond? And then what would you do if you had somebody like Elijah, somebody that you didn't know, that came and asked you for a glass of water? And then he didn't stop there. 
he had the guts to ask her for something to eat too. The nerve of this guy. What a royal jerk. I mean, it's not enough to ask for water, and sure, I'll be happy to do that, but now you want food, and you don't have a clue what I'm going through. Isn't that how we feel sometimes? It's a story. A story that's real. A story that we can relate to. Many times in our lives we come to a place where literally, I mean, we have nothing. We are literally down to bare bones. We have nothing. And the fact that somebody would have the nerve to ask for what little bit we have left. Which brings me to the great request. Not only is this a story... But you got to understand there is a request. Here we find this widow. She's at the city gates. She's gathering up sticks to make a fire for her funeral meal. A stranger that, who we know as Elijah, she doesn't know at all, asks her for a drink, verse 10. He said, just bring me a little water in a cup. Now I got to tell you, I'm not like the widow. I probably wouldn't have the same response that she had. In fact, the widow didn't run. The widow's response to the first request amazes me because she steps out of her own suffering to provide this man a drink whom she doesn't even know. Is that like us? Probably not. For most of us, we're in the midst of our suffering. We're in the midst of our turmoil. We're in the midst of a storm in our life. And we are so focused on us that we're never able to see the needs and the hurts and the brokenness of other people. And if somebody would dare ask something of us in the middle of our suffering, we probably wouldn't respond with such great compassion. We probably wouldn't respond with such great generosity because in that moment in time, everything about our life is about me, 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 me. But this dear lady had a different take. She stepped out of her own suffering, out of her own need to provide this man, Elijah, with a drink. But then Elijah takes his request even further. Shockingly, he asks this woman who has nothing but a little bit of flour, nothing but a little bit of oil, to bring some bread with the water. I'm going to tell you, I could imagine the woman screaming, Bread? Are you crazy? I got to stop right here. If y'all that are on social media, you probably saw my post this past week. We had the joy of going over to Justin and Talissa Thomas's to meet baby Karsten. And we went over and, you know, uh, been able to enjoy the baby and all this. And for just a moment, baby Carson, <laughs> my wife has given me this really, really bad look right now. <laughs> Honey, is there something you need to go do? <laughs> Baby Carson got a little fussy. And so they brought in this little syringe and they said, here, give him a little drop or two of this. He'll calm down. And they put a little drop or two right in the corner of his mouth. And boy, he calmed down. He just smoothed out and went right to sleep. And I said, man, what is that stuff? And they brought it over and it's gripe water. It's called gripe water. It comes in a little bottle. And I said, I'm curious, would this work on my wife? <laughs> so I took a picture and I put it on social media. 
asking if it work on our wife. I said, listen, it's the secret that every man needs to learn. What I learned was I was digging my own grave. I had just made that post. And I walked into my house, <laughs> and my wife was standing there looking at me like this. I said, well, hello, honey. I'm home. <laughs> Little did I know that she had me a box of my favorite chocolate-covered cherries that she did not give me right away. <laughs> Took a few moments for us to kiss and make up. And then I was granny with my chocolate-covered cherries. And then I was determined that I need to do something here and everybody else helped me that maybe it was us men that needed the gripe water instead of the women. I don't know. I'm not going there. <laughs> but I, I'm thinking maybe a request at this point she might have needed some gripe water. <laughs> she might have needed something to calm her down just a little bit. I mean, I can imagine she's probably thinking, look, I'm all by myself. There is a famine everywhere in the land. We are starving. We are dying. And you're asking me for bread? How dare you? I can't believe you would do such a thing. But the widow doesn't flip out. She doesn't run away. She simply responds in verse 12 and she says, I swear by the Lord, your God, that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. But I love Elijah's response. Now, we need to understand something. Back in the very beginning, something I failed to point out to you was in verse 8. The scripture said, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow to feed there, to, there to feed you. Understand this whole story began with one man's obedience to God. God told Elijah, go to the village of Zarephath. Now, Elijah could have said, God, I'm not going there. I don't like those people. They're jerks. They're stuck up. I'm not going to Zarephath. But Elijah was a man who was obedient to God. And so Elijah then goes to Zarephath. He's obedient. He's doing what God's asked him to do. Now in verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 13. But Elijah said to her, the man of God, representative of God, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just as you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then... Use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. Here's what Elijah was saying. That's what this is significant of. You putting God first. Elijah was a representative of God. He was the man of God for the hour. He was anointed and appointed to go to Zarephath for this one particular lady. And what's really happening here is Elijah saying, when you feed me first, you are putting God first. You're going all in. And when you put God first, that means everything else in your life is blessed. Amen. Everything else in your life is able to be multiplied by God. And then the story turns. For Elijah declares in verse number 14, For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. 
Wow, what a turn. So wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not just going to feed you and then make a meal for me and my son, but I'm going to have food ongoing until God sends rain on the earth for the crops to grow again, and that means we won't miss a meal. Woo, hallelujah, that's good stuff. I can shout about that because, man, if I start thinking about missing a meal, I go into deep despair, all right? I'm not going to miss a meal. God's going to provide for me. Now, you may not eat three meals a day. I require, I require three meals a day and about four snacks. And sometimes a fourth meal, especially if Taco Bell's open. Whatever it takes. The story concludes with blessing in verse number 15. I love this part. So she did as Elijah said, obedience. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. You see the blessing there? But there's a choice. There's a choice. See, this is one of the many choices of faith that are all over this biblical narrative. Will the widow do what makes sense and keep the oil for herself and her son? Or will she entrust the last thing she has on earth to the care of the creator of heaven and earth and the one who owns everything that is in it? I think about this dear widow. She's at the very end of a rope and she chose to make the prophet his requested cake. What would you have done? Sometimes I think if we're honest with ourselves, many of us would have kept the ingredients all to ourselves. Because that's our nature. Our nature is to be selfish. Our nature is to be all about me. Our, our nature is to make sure that I'm taken care of first. You see, we have a flawed philosophy in our world. That says, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. We have many flawed philosophies in our world. There's one that says, look out for number one, for nobody else will. You see, world and humanistic philosophy is all about me. It's self-centered. And it's the point of where sin begins. If you take the word sin and you circle the middle letter, it's all centered on I. Pride, ego, me. But by acting in faith, the widow not only made Elijah a cake, but she made a cake for her son. And she was able to make many, many meals after that for the flour and the oil didn't run out. You know what's amazing to me? The blessing of the endless flower is a physical picture that the giver of life had invaded her life by his amazing grace. See, long before she had ever eaten his provision, he had chosen her to not only experience life, but to be an instrument of the prophet's continuing life and ministry. God often asks us to offer what is left to do with it greater than our little minds could ever possibly imagine or conceive. In closing, when she went out to pick up the sticks for her last meal, the widow of Zarephath had no idea the incredible turn her life was about to take. It would not be her last day nor her last meal because what was lurking over her was not the shadow of death, but it was the giver of life who would not only give her life, but through her life would preach life to all who would believe from that point forward. And to think it all began with a stranger's seemingly outrageous request followed by a beautiful, faithful act 
of obedience. The question is, will you and I go all in for Jesus? Will we give it all because we love and trust the one who owns it all and has already gone all in for us? What will we do with a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil that we have left? Will we hoard it for ourselves? In fact, many of us will eat our provision. Rather than allowing God to bless it and multiply it, we will literally eat our blessing. We will eat our provision. Understand that our life is literally a conduit for which the blessings of God flow through. And as long as we keep the pipe, the conduit open, the blessings of God will continue to flow through and they will not stop until we stop up the conduit. One act of disobedience could have stopped the flow of flour and oil. One act of disobedience could literally stop the blessings in our life. So my question to you today is, are you ready to push all of your chips to the center? And do you trust God enough that you're ready to say, I'm all in? Do you trust God enough with what God has entrusted with you to be able to say, God, I'm trusting you with all that I am, all that I have, all that I ever hope to be. I'm going all in and I am trusting you. Will you stop up the conduit today? Will you be the one that will literally stop the flow of the blessings of God in your life? If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, the greatest choice you have in your life today is to make him the Lord of your life. It's really simple. The Bible says that we must believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. He died on an old rugged cross at Calvary. He shed his life's blood for the forgiveness of your sins. For his free gift of salvation. Believe in your heart that he is the Son of God and he is the only way whereby you can be saved. And with your mouth, confession is made that Jesus is Lord of your life. If you're here today, if you're watching online, if you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, I'm going to invite you to pray with me today. And I'm going to invite you to pray and mean it in your heart and make Jesus the Lord of your life. It'll be the best choice you've ever made in your life. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to invite you to make Jesus the Lord of your life today. Simply pray with me, meet it in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that God gave his all for me. As you died on the cross at Calvary, and you gave your life's blood for the forgiveness of my sin. I receive it today. I receive the free gift of salvation. I turn from my sin and I choose to follow you. I dethrone self and I enthrone Jesus throne of my heart I make you my Lord and I choose to follow you 
all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I want everybody to look right here. If you prayed that prayer this morning, you gave your heart and life to Jesus, and you're watching online, I want you to write me, pastor at graceway365.com. But if you're here in the house and you prayed that prayer this morning, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'm going to ask you in just a few moments when we get ready to sing, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and make your way to this altar and grab me by the hand and say, Pastor D, I prayed that prayer with you this morning. I meant it and I made Jesus the Lord of my life. For the rest of us, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I ready to go all in with Jesus? Am I ready to surrender it all? Am I ready to put all the chips on the table? Am I ready to go all in? Stand with me all over the house. All of this is only possible through one word. Trust. Trust. That's it. Will you trust him today? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you for the ability to be able to trust you when we can't trust ourselves, when we can't trust anybody else around us. God, we're grateful because we know that you are God and every promise in God is yes and amen. So today, help us to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus lest we trust and obey. Have your will in your way right now, God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together, you come. These altars are open. Won't you come? Come on. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. What about you? Just to take him at his word. Come on. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the saying the Lord. Won't you come? Jesus, Jesus. How I trust Him Just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me beneath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. to 
trust him more. Father God, I just want to come before you right now thanking you for all these who've come to pray today. Father, thank you for people today who are trusting you to do for them in their lives what they cannot do for themselves. Some are trusting you with relationships. Some are trusting you with marriages. Some are trusting you with finances. Some are trusting you, Lord, with jobs, hobbies. Some are trusting you in the area of their spiritual condition. Some are trusting you in the area of their children and parenting and child raising. God, we thank you that you are so good that you love us, your children, so much that, God, you call us to put our full faith and trust in you. And as we do, God, you bless us. You honor our obedience, God. Lord, it's not based upon what we do. It's based upon what you've already done. But God, you want to use us to be part of the miracle. And so Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to go all in. And as we do, you promise us, God, that you won't stop the flow of blessings in our lives. So today, we go all in and we honor you as we seek to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. As we plunder hell to populate heaven, use us, your people. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name.